Very good. Well, thank you, Lucia. Uh, just glad to have you all here. I'm just excited about this opportunity to kind of discuss second chance employment. And it's a very difficult, kind of confusing world, and we'll get into some solutions. Um, uh, I have been an employer for over 50 years. A lot of those assignments were directly HR director. Um, and uh, so uh, the, every, every journey starts with a story. And uh, I was serving as HR safety director for a group of companies um, a few years ago, and we wanted to hire a diesel mechanic. And we found out that this person had a was a, a, a level one sex offender, and I'd never hired anybody with that severe uh, a level. And uh, we wanted to hire him, but I didn't know how to do it. Uh, so I, I called around and asked people, and I, I didn't find any answers for what do I need to have in my documentation that shows we did our due diligence. So I, that kind of started me out uh, after I retired. I started doing research and working with people in levels of law enforcement, and corrections, trying to figure out what what can I put in the hands of employers that's going to help them uh, know how to do this and, and uh, satisfy the EEOC requirements to do the compliance there and um, uh, protect themselves against lawsuits. So uh, that's that led to the formation of the solution was a, a website that's called fairchanceemployer.com and we'll talk about that a little later. But uh, this, this conversation today is not going to be much uh, about why you should access this population or why they would make good employees. But uh, I found that there's a dearth of information uh, or, or lack of information about how do you actually do this. Um, so we're gonna, this is kind of a how-to uh, conversation today. And I hope uh, the goals here um, uh, are, is that when you, when you get done today, you're gonna have all the information you need to know to access this population and provide the compliance uh, protection for your organization. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and start this, um, uh, do the screen share here. Everybody see the blue lady? Yes. Okay, very good, okay. So, um, yeah. Oh, I had a little trouble getting started here, so I'm going to try this again. Okay, we're good. All right, so we're, this is what we're talking about today, evaluating candidates for the criminal record. Um, and I always start off with the disclaimer, I'm not an attorney, uh, but um, as Alicia uh, indicated, we have uh, some folks here today uh, from um, Wagner, Falk and Judd uh, Law Firm in Minneapolis. Uh, and I'd like to just turn it over to them so they can introduce themselves. Thank you so much, Dick and Alicia. Uh, this is Lauren Skildum. I'm an attorney. Um, th this is my boss, Mike. So <laughs> we, uh, Wagner, Faulkner and Judd, we're a law firm that's been around for over 80 years and we do employment law. Um, we are very passionate about helping small businesses, large businesses with their um, employee and employment law um, related needs. And so today and this presentation, you have myself, um, you also have Sophie Dietrich, who is an HR professional. You have Margot Ritter, who is an HR professional. And then Kayla Gerlach, who is our records management and client intake and assists um, clients as they need um, our resources. So we are happy to be part of this conversation. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. And I guess I have a, a recommendation for these these folks. I've used them for years, uh, and their little model there simplify uh, the uh, um, things that are uh, complex. 
And uh, I, they do exactly that. I, I've used them for years and I highly recommend if you don't have an HR firm um, that you can lean on for those difficult questions, um, if, uh, I would highly recommend these people. Um, uh, and I think you'll, as you go by through the, the presentation, you'll probably find out why, but they're just very sharp and very prompt in their, in their turnaround time. So um, we're taking a look at um, um, folks here and uh, the, um, I'd like to give you some some key takeaways today. Um, I want to give you some quick hits from my research. Um, I want to go ahead and, and co cover the three most common mistakes that I see. Um, I want to go ahead and give you the four takeaways uh, for a fair chance process. Um, and so then the, the first takeaway here is what about the ban the, the box statute? What about the decisions not to employ? Um, the ban the box statute, Minnesota is one of about 37 states that have this statute. It, it uh, covers both private and public employers. You go to Wisconsin, the statute only covers public employers. So in, in Minnesota, all employers um, cannot have the, the little box on the application that says, uh, have you been convicted of a crime or felony or whatever? So uh, if if you just kind of check your your paperwork and if you still have that box in your um, on your website or on a, on your application somehow, just eliminate that uh, if you are a Minnesota employer. Um, uh, and, and what about the decision not to employ? You know, what happens when we, you know, most of the problems have happen when people, you know, offer the job, they, they get the background check back and, you know, oh gosh, Charlie's got a felony. What do we do now? And, and there's sometimes a little apprehension uh, and fear about that, but there's a process that, um, um, th that you follow for that. Uh, takeaway number two is this category of candidates, a viable source of, of, for employees for us. Um, takeaway number three, or what are the ground rules we need to follow in order to protect our organization and uh, EOC compliance? Um, and then has a fair chance process been developed that can help us um, properly evaluate these folks and provide the protections for our organization? So, um, so the band the box we talked about, you have a handout, I think most of you got, uh, it's just a one page document. I just gave you a copy of what the, the statute's all about. Uh, on the back side, uh, you have the actual statute and it tells us that um, you can, you're not supposed to uh, find out about their criminal history until you schedule an, app, an, uh, an interview or you uh, have a conditional job offer. And most people I know uh, have been advised that you just wait till the job offer, do it then, don't do it before then, just wait till you've, you've chosen that person, do the do the background check after you have the, the signed job offer. Uh, and and there's there's no problem in backing out and making that, that call after you get the, the job offer. And then we'll be talking about that today. Um, you folks, uh, um, attorneys, you have any any words of advice on this process? Hi, yeah, thanks, Dick, for sending it over to us. Um, one thing to remember with the ban the box is it just prevents you from asking up front and potentially taking a good candidate out of the running before you know if they're actually a good fit for the job. And what's important there to keep in mind is it depends on the position and the situation for that unique individual. So um, as you mentioned, you know, you, you want to give an offer letter that's contingent on a background check, right? There's no promise there of, of employment until that background is cleared. And that's because, as I mentioned, that position or situation is important. So when you look at those background check results, let's say if you're hiring a receptionist and she has a DUI background, right? So does that DUI impact her ability to do her job as a receptionist is what you have to ask. And that answer, of course, would be no, most likely, right? Your receptionist is not going to be driving around. Whereas if you were hiring for a delivery driver and that delivery driver came back with a DUI on their record, then that would affect or impact their ability to do their job. So that's that's kind of that situational determination you have to think through. What is the position you're hiring for? And is their record directly related to that or not? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so then what, what, what happens if after reviewing the check, we decide not to hire a candidate? How do you actually do that? Well, there's a, there's a process for that. 
And the EEOC says that um, if we deny employment, it should be based on reasons, and the quote is, consistent with business necessity. And uh, that just follows with uh, the, the explanation that you just heard about the DUI and so forth. That's it, it makes per it's really common sense, but but you need to make sure that you're not going to just do a broad brush elimination of a certain kind of crime or whatever. It's just it needs to be an individualized assessment. Um, so um, Target uh, a few years ago, you, you may not be aware of this, but anyway, they had they got into a big. Um, um, problem with EEOC, uh, and they were slapped with a six million dollar fine and some pretty serious, serious hand slapping. And the um, uh, the um, uh, language that they put in their press release after uh, they adjusted and changed their processes, uh, I think, is worth sharing. It's it's something that you could probably copy and use for your own policies, but it says, we exclude applicants whose criminal histories could pose a risk to our guests, team members, or property, and design our process to treat all applicants fairly while maintaining a safe and secure working and shopping environment for team members and guests. So that's how they frame it. You know, it's it uh, gives them uh, enough latitude to make those kind of decisions, and they're able to kind of state clearly up front how they make those decisions. Uh, so the the process is if you if you say you know what uh, based on this background check I, we've changed our mind we don't want to hire this person you send out it's called an adverse action process and you send out a couple letters. Um, um, the uh, attorneys you want to address that any, any comments you make on that? Sure. So. Um, your first letter would be, uh, you'd send out this adverse action letter number one that says, hey, your criminal background check did uh, reveal this, you know, incarceration or this criminal um, history. And we think it is relevant to the job position. And um, we would like, uh, and, and for that reason, um, we may not be proceeding or we, we won't be uh, proceeding forward with offering the employment. However, we would like to hear from you if there is a, if you would like, you're opening, so in this letter, you're opening up the conversation that if there is something inaccurate, if there's some more information you think we should know before we make this decision, please give that to us. So you're, you're letting them know that we found something in the history. It is relevant to the position. So we're not gonna be extending that offer based on the background check, but please um, giving them an opportunity to uh, engage in, in a process of communication and a dialogue. So, cause perhaps they have a very common name and Joe Smith has quite the rap sheet, but he, that's the wrong Joe Smith. And so you're giving them an opportunity to raise that, to say, actually, that's not me. You, that your background company drew the wrong criminal history or for them to say that, hey, that charge that I have already done my time for actually shouldn't keep me from this and here's why. And they get to have that. Now, and then adverse action letter no, number two, would pro would be after you've engaged in that conversation, we you know we still um, we are we are not going to offer you that employment. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you for that information. Um, but essentially, documenting the fact that you went through the process, you gave them an opportunity to respond, and you are still going to not be um, engaging. Uh, you're not able because of their criminal history to offer them that position. Uh, this is it has the wording on this form has to be pretty um, precise, and uh, the background check companies that you use should be able to offer you assistance in this area. Uh, they're they're kind of also experts in in this process. So uh, if don't feel you have to kind of craft this thing on your own, you've got some help out there. Uh, so I, I wouldn't pull it off the internet. I would go to your background check company, and and they get these questions all the time. So they would be a good source to to help you with those letters. Okay, takeaway number two is this, are these valuable employees, uh, viable employees? 
So uh, first thing, I, I, got, I get a lot of questions on, well, how many people are we really talking about? I mean, uh, so what I, when I speak to people in a geographic area, uh, I like to kind of talk about, well, how many people are in your, your area? So every, every plant out there has kind of a, you know, a few counties they probably draw from uh, for employment. So we know that um, there are about seven to 8,000 people released every year from Minnesota prisons, but the numbers that go through the counties uh, might surprise you. Surprise you. So I, I took this look at just the, the Arrowhead region, um, um, uh, and uh, so if you if the counties, I would think that would be probably folks that you would draw from up there, um, including a, 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 a Douglas County in Wisconsin. Um, if you take a look at the violent crimes, there look these are the numbers per year, and then so monthly uh, that would add up to you know, about fifty four people. Um, in addition to the state folks out there. And then, but if you take a look at the property crimes, you know, that's of course way more. Uh, so you're looking at, at about 759 people coming out of incarceration of some kind uh, or have some kind of criminal record just in that geographic region. So, um, um, and, and these are, uh, these are actually FBI numbers. So, um, other uh, other some there's a lot of surveys out there that talk about uh, the employment of incarcerated people. This is one I took from the Sherm article. I found that two thirds of HR professionals think that the quality of work is as high or higher for folks that have a criminal record as folks who don't. So, and, and anecdotally, when I talk to people, that's exactly the same uh, answer I get. Wow, these people are dedicated. They, they want to make sure, uh, you know, that they're, 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 they're loyal. They take care of their job. They don't, they're never late. So they often, most of the time, these people are pretty good employees. Uh, however, the, the same survey showed that there are employee concerns. You know, what, what's the legal liability? What are customer reactions? What about government regulations? And that's actually, that's why we're all here today, because those are some concerns that we have. Um, another article I had uh, from the BBC uh, drew uh, heavily on a, um, uh, a longitudinal study offered by a UMass sociologist uh, of felons in the military. And um, uh, what they found uh, was one of the more striking findings was the more pronounced promotion success for enlistees with felony waivers. Now, the military doesn't often uh, enlist folks with a felony, except when they're having um, difficulties filling their recruitment goals. And then they issue what's called a felony waiver. And this study showed that these people are 32% more likely to be promoted to the rank of sergeant than similar enlistees with no felony history. And I mean, that's a pretty significant number. And, and especially because this is a performance-based promotion. There's no politics in here. Um, there's no nepotism in here. This is like, you know, we're, we, you've done a great job. We're going to give you promotion and give you more responsibility. And by the way, you're going to be responsible for other people. So uh, that, that's an interesting finding from that study. Okay, so what are the ground rules we need to follow in order to protect our organization and satisfy the EEOC compliance regs? So two major concerns we have is uh, every, every hiring manager is how do we document that we've followed the EEOC guidelines because they're very hard to document? And two, what documentation do we need to guard against a negligent hire lawsuit? So um, would you attorneys like to weigh in on the uh, negligent hire issue? Yes, absolutely. So, so a negligent hire claim is, is one in which an employer is held liable for injury or death caused by one of your employees if the employer was negligent in hiring the employee in the first place. So this is, this is critical for Minnesota employers to carefully screen job, job applicants um, especially those who could injure coworkers or members of the public based on the nature of the job responsibilities and their interactions with others. So, um, you know, the employer, you know, in the, the elements of this claim is that the employer has a duty owed a duty to the plaintiff. So a, a duty to a coworker um, to exercise reasonable care in the hiring of that employee and that the employer breached that duty by hiring an employee when it knew or should have known that employee was unfit for duty. And then, and then the plaintiff must have been injured. So you've got a, a worker who got injured and then your breach, that employer's breach was the proximate cause of the plaintiff's injury. So, so 
really, you know, the duty here is that you, you do that due diligence of that criminal background check so that you can find people who are potentially um, a danger to your other workforce um, employees or to the public. If you're interfacing with the public, um, you have to do that reasonable investigation before, before you bring them on. So not before you interview them to back up to be on the box, you, you offer, you, you bring in good candidates who look good. And then when you make them an offer, it's contingent upon that background check. And then you do that background check and you make sure that you're not hiring people who have violent felony convictions, if they could potentially be, um, you know, depending on what that position is, could they harm or, or um, be a danger or, or a, a risk to your other employees. So um, that, uh, you know, that's, that's that's a broad brush broad brush strokes on that, um, you know. And and really, what documentation do you need? You're just going to want to have a process. You're going to want to have a process that you're always following, so that you show that you did do these steps that Dick is talking about, so that you can show that you did your reasonable due diligence. You did the background check. There was nothing there that prohibited you from, you know, re um, hiring the receptionist who had a DUI. It wasn't related to her capacity um, in her receptionist uh, job responsibilities. And so it was, she was eligible for that position. You brought her on um, and that had nothing to do with something that she did off of company time with maybe a coworker that she was hanging out with um, after work at a happy hour that was not um, organized by the company. Um, you know, if I'm just making, a huge hypothetical situation or, you know, story there for you to draw to the conclusion. Thank you very much. Hope that clears it up for everybody. Um, so the next thing, uh, another handout that you, you might have is, uh, is this document here. It's a copy from the EEOC, directly from the EEOC website that lays out the ground rules that we have to follow. Um, so uh, a couple of things that we'll take a look at. If you turn, uh, go to the back and number four, uh, here's how it reads. Determine how the applicant's criminal history relates to the risks and responsibilities of the job. Among other things, consider the nature or gravity of the crime, the crime that has passed since the criminal conduct occurred, and the nature of the job. And the nature of the job is just what they would discuss, you know, the, 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 the DUI versus the reception. So you have to make that call. Um, the, the theory on the time that's passed, of course, is the longer you go without any reoffending, uh, then the less, uh, less alarmed we are uh, about that. Um, and then the nature of the gravity crime, that is the sticking point. That's where it's really difficult to um, uh, to navigate, so we'll get to the to the uh, explain the, the people explaining their criminal history a little bit later. But uh, let's take a look at at uh, the problem there. In Minnesota, we have four levels of crime: felony, gross misdemeanor, misdemeanor, and petty misdemeanor. And uh, when I started doing my research, tried to figure out how to how to work in this world, um, I found out actually it's from a criminal attorney. Um, that there are 11 levels of felony in Minnesota. You go to um, Wisconsin, let's say, and they've got felony A, felony B, felony C. So an employer can kind of get a sense on how severe uh, that particular crime is. But in Minnesota, we don't do that. It just says felony. And, and I have yet to talk to a group of employers or, or HR people in any in any um, grouping, and I've asked them, are there? Do you know if there's if Minnesota has any levels of felony? Nobody knows that, um, and um, and I didn't, you know, until I started doing research. So um, th this this makes it difficult for us in, in Minnesota because when you get the background check, it just says felony. It doesn't tell you what's what level it is. So um, if if you go on the uh, um, Department of uh, I can't remember what what um, website this is, Department of Corrections, it might be, uh, but you find this document, and this is where the listing of the statutes by uh, severity level, this is what it looks like. Uh, but again, this presents a problem. It's not a cert, it's not a sortable um, database. You can't go there and say, okay, I got somebody at the top there, set the firearm, 609.52, um, you can't put put that in and it, it pops, spits out a severity level. You got to go through every stinking page and looking for that particular statute to see if it, it has a severity level on it. Um, so they use, in this case, they use a, uh, a numeric score, 1 to 11, 
uh, on severity. Uh, but if you go to um, sex-related crimes, they use an alpha sequencing score. And if that wasn't bad enough, you go to drug-related crimes and they use an alphanumeric score. I mean, could it be any harder for us as employers to figure out how to satisfy the severity of a crime? Um, it just the, the just makes it very, very difficult. And, and to top it off, if I've got a couple locations and one of them's in a different state, these statutes are completely different. You go to Wisconsin and the theft of a firearm statute is 943.20. It's a different number. The narrative is different. The severity uh, level is rated differently and the penalties are different. So it's very difficult for a, a multi-state employer to try to satisfy those requirements uh, because it, it's a moving target. They're all different. Um, so that's one of the things we try, so we set out to try to solve um, in the website we've created to, to help you guys. Um, so on to the common errors. Uh, we consider candidates with a criminal record, but not if they have a violent crime in their history. I hear this all the time. And when you were talking about, you know, trying to, to consider the severity of the crime, I mean, this is, this is how I operated for a while. It just kind of makes common sense. Well, you know, got to draw the line somewhere. So let's just say if they got a violent crime, um, we're just going to exclude them. So, but this is one of the major problems that uh, Dollar General and Target ran into when they uh, were doing their hiring and they got fined heavily from um, uh, the, the EOC. And, and there are a number of reasons for this, but the main reason is, is the crime data by race. If you've got African-Americans are 13% of the population and uh, they're convicted of 23% of the violent crimes. So, and that was what this, this court case is all about that, that started these EEOC rules. Um, so if I've got, if I'm excluding certain, everybody that has a violent crime, I'm affecting um, people of a certain race more than others. And that's called disparate treatment um, or, or disparate impact. And uh, that's that's not allowed. Uh, you, you can't make those broad brush sweeping um, judgments uh, for these types of crimes, for the criminal history. Uh, the second most common error that I see is not using a reputable background check, a company from uh, company for your background check. There are good companies out there and there are bad companies out there. And we could do, I've been to webinars where they just, it's all just talking about background check companies and how you know um, that you're getting a good one or not. And um, so uh, you, you need to make sure that you you have a good, a good company you're working with. Um, uh, I have, I can recommend these two. I, I've worked with trusted employees for years. Uh, their, their pricing is very good. Their turnaround time is excellent. Their customer service is, is very superb. Uh, total insight screening. I've also been to some of their, um, uh, their, their webinars. So I know that these two, I can recommend these two uh, as being uh, um, very qualified, uh, thorough companies that would be great partners for you. The third most common error is not holding an interview to discuss the candidate's criminal history. And that's what we talked about that a little bit on that, that uh, slide we looked at earlier. And let's, let's go ahead and take the time to read number seven now. Give applicants an opportunity to explain their criminal history. Inform applicants if they may be excluded from consideration because of poor criminal conduct. Provide them with an opportunity to respond and consider um, uh, reevaluating them based on their explanation. So. Um, one of the um, one of the issues that that you have. Let's so let's just take um, an example of, of why that's important. Let's say I've got a, a supervisor uh, candidate that I'm looking for that I, I really like, and um, we uh, we we ask for his GD two fourteen. That's a form that all military people are supplied with. If you uh, if if you find out the person has military experience, you should ask for this form. They they will provide it for you. Everyone who's um, discharged from the service is given this form. There's a lot of things on there that will tell you the pay level that they retired at, the kind of training that they've had, places they've served. There's just a wealth of information, but also gives the reason for um, discharge. Uh, and let's just say I, I do my research on this and I find out that uh, this guy was dishonorably discharged for conduct unbecoming. Uh, 
Well, now all of a sudden, I'm not quite so so excited about this guy. So I, I hold my interview and I, I sit down and ask him, Just we just talk about his criminal history. And I, I give this person, uh, as the EEOC guideline says, an opportunity to explain their side of the story and, and have a, an honest discussion um, about what happened and and uh, just educate you a bit more. And let's just say that during this discussion, I find out that this guy's commanding officer is this guy. So um, we all know how this turned out, but I wouldn't have known this if I didn't have that interview. So having that interview was very, very important um, if you're gonna make a, a good uh, judgment call. And if you take a look again at this target, um, uh, statement. Uh, they're saying on there, um, part of that press release is individuals are given an opportunity to explain their criminal history and provide information about the circumstances, the mitigating factors, uh, and conduct conduct unbecoming. So um, that again, that's good language, uh, and that's that's a process that we all should be following. Having that conversation if there's criminal history, and giving that opportunity to that person to explain it. Um, WFJ, you guys have anything to add there? No, I, you're covering it real well, Dick. That was good. Okay, thanks. Okay, so another terminology that's kind of entered into the to the lexicon here is the EOC wants us to be using an individualized assessment. And that gets back to um, the, the example that, that you heard about the DUI and the, and the receptionist or the driver. Um, you know, we need to be doing that. And, and so individualized assessment is, a tr is terminology I'm seeing a lot in our EEOC uh, publications. And if you, if you want to work that into your documents or into your policies, that would be probably a good idea. Um, and just to make sure that you're following a policy where you're not saying people with a violent record, we're not going to hire them. We're not going to hire people with uh, with anybody with a DUI. Well, you know, it's, it doesn't apply in some situations. So making sure that you're using that judgment and and in using that terminology would be a good idea. Jim, so I'm going to jump yes. in one second. So it, it so maybe looking through your materials as an employer, like that there's just no blanket statements. You just so so what it what it what shows that you have an individualized approach? There's no blanket statements whatsoever. So that's all I wanted to add. Yeah, excellent advice. So another question I have is, well, are there any state and federal incentives to hiring this population? Uh, actually, there are no state incentives, but there are some federal ones. And if you go to the Minnesota Deed uh, website, there's a call, there's a federal bonding program. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but basically it's a it's a um, insurance policy protecting you from theft. Uh, and it's free. I think it lasts for six months and it's through Travelers Insurance, but it's completely paid for by the government. Uh, to, to help you help mitigate any risk you have of bringing someone on, you know, if, if you're a contractor and you got, you know, lots of tools and, and vehicles with, with parts and so forth in them, uh, if something ends up missing, uh, then you're protected. So that, that's a good program. Um, and, uh, you know, every, every employer, I think, is um, um, open to, to use that. And the other one is called uh, the Work Opportunity Tax Credit. And this is, um, again, uh, every, every employer has the opportunity to, to access this. Uh, however, you have to file some paperwork immediately. You want to jump right on this because it's very time sensitive. And uh, you, you get a tax credit. I think it's up to $9,600 per employee. And then I know some employers that are, they're really, uh, they're hawks on this, man. They find out that they got somebody that's, that's recently been incarcerated. You know, they, they get that person qualified and, and, you know, they get this big, big savings at the end of the year when they file the taxes. Um, so it's a, it's an excellent program, but there, those are two incentives from the government that help us. Um, and the last takeaway, has a fair chance process been developed that can help us uh, properly evaluate this population and provide those protections? Well, uh, that's one of the reasons, remember this, uh, the severity crime issue, uh, that's one of the things we took on when we developed this website to try to help employers uh, navigate all, all this. And we created a web, this is a picture of our database uh, on our website. And you take, you know, you take a look at all these statutes. I've got about eight, 
hundred or nine hundred statutes that we preloaded and scored for you, um, and we've we've taken them from the basic, uh, the most common areas that uh, categories that you would expect: crimes against people, crimes against property, drug related, sex related, and vehicular. And so we can give you a score, and we take all those confusing things and and put them in a mixer, and we we give you a score that's validated. Most of them are state related, or uh, it's those things are validated by state officials, law enforcement, parole officers, um, public defenders, a number of people who help me put this scoring together. That's very proprietary for us, but this is this is what we've done. We've given you an actual score for every crime that appears on your background check. Um, so then you you have I think the third uh, C uh, handout C. It, this gives you the, what this this report looks like. You 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 join our website. You every time you have a background check, you go in and you punch in the state, the statute number, the date, and so forth, and it spits out this candidate dashboard. And if you take a closer look at it, you you find out that, that it has a position at the, at the top. We're going to hire a driver. Uh, this ha happened to be a Wisconsin and a Minnesota violation. Um, it has it right on there. Uh, the level of offense is you know misdemeanor A, and uh, the gravity score for that crime in that state is a 28. Um, and then you know if it's again if this is a operating uh, under the influence, uh, it's a driver. We know that that's a direct correlation. So you have the opportunity as an employer to make that call. It tells you you need to make that judgment call. But how, again, it's the, the language says you need to consider these things. And I've been to a lot of these webinars uh, put on by some pretty high level HR folks um, about, you know, how to do this process. And they always get down to this point where it's documenting the EEOC guidelines. And they always kind of throw up their hands. They say, you know, good luck. You know, you need to develop some kind a spreadsheet or you need to develop some kind of uh, worksheet or something that that helps you uh, be able to prove that you're using a consistent approach and you're you're looking at these things and as, as an individualized assessment so as you weigh in you have the opportunity to choose when you do this entry which of these boxes you would you would uh, go by never rarely somewhat often or directly and which one you choose affects the score as you can see over there the gravity score was a 28 but on I'm saying that for my situation, this is a this is directly so this is a bit is a great concern for me. So I'm showing that I'm making that call by the score raising. The score makes it say that I'm I have a bigger concern. And then the years since offense, the the, the um, attitude of course is the longer you go, the the less of an issue it is. So then the that adjusted score is reduced uh, one seventh every year. Um, so it kind of gives you the adjusted score. So it puts all three of those guidelines into perspective and gives you a, a score that really evens things out. It makes things uh, across the board. Uh, it's very, uh, it's, it's a very good process to, to help employers at that stage of things. Um, then we also provide, we came up, worked with a number of HR attorneys and uh, people we found that were a little bit skittish about having that interview about the criminal history. So we give you a, a template to use. We give you a sample to start with. Um, so, so that's very helpful to employers. Um, and the other question we get is, can we talk to a parole officer or law enforcement officer with uh, about a candidate? Well, um, you know, when we when someone comes out of incarceration, uh, giving them a uh, reference uh, check um, release to check with their previous employers doesn't really do us much good. It's they haven't been employed for a while. So um, the person that knows the most about that person is their parole officer. You know, and I, I would want to find out, hey, uh, is this person abiding by the terms of their release? And unfortunately, in Minnesota, there is not a release form that allows you to do that. Wisconsin has one that's, that you just go online and fill it out and send it to the parole officer. But Minnesota, I talked with these parole officers and showed them the language, the release language from our our usual um, background check, our reference check, and they said, "Well, that language doesn't doesn't allow us to respond." So I worked with them and you know, worked with state and county parole officers, and we came up with with the language, um, and we created a, a sample reference check form that, that you would have that person sign a release, and then you would send that to the parole officer, and that allows you to have or law enforcement officers it allows you to have that conversation and know just a little bit more about that applicant. So at the beginning, I said my problem was I didn't know what to have 
in my folder to protect my organization and prove what we did our due diligence. So here's my recommendation. Um, you should have some type of document that shows that you're 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 following the EEOC guidelines, and and I think this candidate dashboard idea is uh, really easy to use and makes it really simple. Um, but you have to have something like this. You should have a copy of the statute and a copy of the job description in your file. Um, you should also have your copy of your interview notes you held about the, the criminal history, and you should have uh, this reference check for the pro officer if, if you can, um, if, if, if that's appropriate. It isn't in every case. So um, that's my recommendation. Uh, anything else to add, folks? No, that was great. Uh, I think, you know, being thorough is just you know a great process to have in place so that you're not scrambling in the event that someone wants to look more carefully at how you've been operating and making those hiring decisions. So here's a, I'll, I'll kind of stay on this slide for a little while in case you want to make some notes. This is the, the slide where you have the contact information for uh, uh, the, the law firm well, Wagner, Faulkner and Judd. Um, you know, they have a pretty sizable staff of HR people, employment attorneys, um, and then I'll, I'll back up to the uh, trusted employees, total insight screening. Those are people that uh, I recommend for um, a, um, to your, do your background screening. Um, if you uh, would have any, um, uh, if you'd like any help, uh, on the bottom of the uh, EEOC form, you'll find my contact information. Uh, if I can be helpful in any way, uh, just let me know. Uh, if you have questions about the website and, and the process, uh, please reach out to me. Happy to spend some time, explain it, and happy to um, uh, help you in any way that you, that you need help with the, the fair chance hiring process. Um, glad, glad to be of assistance. All right, I'm going to stop sharing, Alicia. And we can take a peek and see if any uh, if there are any questions out there. I am not seeing any questions in the chat, but we can certainly open up um, to the group if anybody has any questions at this time. Um, I have one here. It says, do you recommend reference checks for all applicants looking to make, oh, I can't see the other part, looking to make an offer to, and how many? Would you read that again? Do you recommend reference checks for all applicants looking to make an offer to, that you're looking to make an offer to, and how many? Um, we, I, I think most of the forms I've used kind of have three boxes on there, you know, last three employers. That seems to be kind of an unwritten standard in the industry. Um, I, I have worked for an employer that required us to get a complete um, job history from the time they got out of school to the time they entered the workforce. Um, that was an interesting challenge at times, but uh, a rule of thumb is kind of three, but if, if, if they've had three jobs in the last uh, 18 months, then I, I would go a little bit deeper than that uh, and try to find a little bit more, but you, there's no limit to the, the number of, of people that you can ask. I'll jump in too. So it also depends on your states of employment. So there are statues that can vary based on, on where they were working um, and also depends on the employer where they're coming from. Many employers will only do your general verification of employment, which will give your dates of employment and you know your position title and that's about it. Um, whereas other employers, if they're more friendly to a reference check, then they can follow whatever the statute is for the, that particular state. Um, and most of those statutes just say, don't release anything beyond this, right? So that they'll give you some ideas of what, of what you can request. And so that would be an individualized request based on whatever state you're dealing with. Any other questions from the group?
All right. Well, I am not seeing any other questions come through. We're getting so we some do, thumbs up here. <laughs> we got to do it early. Yes, we did. Um, and at, as I mentioned, um, uh, this session was recorded today. So if anybody um, would like a copy of the link, we'll have that available. Um, just want to give a, a special thanks um, to you, Dick, and the and the team at uh, WFJ Law Firm, and uh, for joining us today. Oh, we got a comment or a question here. Uh, we have a manufacturing facility, and we hire production employees on the first shift, and we have been advised per ban, law, ban the box law for these positions that we shouldn't do criminal background checks for these positions. What is your opinion on this? Go ahead. Um. I, I don't... Um... I don't see why you can't ever do a criminal background check because I'm going to reference the negligent hire claim that could come back to bite you. As long as you're taking an individualized approach with that information, once you obtain it, I don't, I, I guess I would disagree with that recommendation that you just flat out do not do a background check. That seems a little risky from an employer perspective. I, I concur. The background check is your number one projection against a negligent hire lawsuit. And it's also a, you know, one of your primary uh, individualized assessment tools. Yeah, good question. that was all of our questions unless anyone has another one um, before we wrap up here but um, again thank you to everybody for for joining us today um, we'll be sending out information on our upcoming workforce development um, web series our, our webinars and so we look forward to seeing you all again and thanks again um, Dick and WFJ for for joining us hope everyone thank you has for a great opportunity. day yes <laughs> take care everyone Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.